Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit, the podcast. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we are talking with Brent Strawn, who is the author of Honest to God Preaching in the Working Preacher book series. Hey, welcome, Brent. Glad uh, glad you can join us for this podcast. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So tell, uh, introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to. So uh, name, Brent Strawn. Uh, I presently teach at uh, Duke University uh, in the Divinity School, where I'm professor of Old Testament, and I also have a secondary appointment in the law school, believe it or not. Uh, and I've been here about three years, uh, brought COVID with me. Um, that was my distinct uh, you know, gift to the Divinity School. Before that, I taught for 18 years at Emory University in Atlanta, and before that in Kentucky. Of course, Rolf, you know that we are classmates from the good old days back in New Jersey. And uh, even further back, if you care to know, I was raised in San Diego, California, where the sun is always shining and the temperature is always about 71 and a half degrees. So that's uh, who I am, I guess, in a nutshell, and, or parts of it. And where were you born? I actually was born in Illinois, south of Chicago, a small town called Kankakee. But we moved to Southern California when I was about three. A song I did not made know famous that. by Steve yeah. Goodman in uh, City of New Orleans, but that's not the point of our conversation today. <laughs> I did not know that about you, uh, Brent. That you were uh, spent a lot of time in California. I'm a Bay Area. There you go. Well, don't hold it against me because I know the Northern no. Cal people think of themselves maybe a little more highly than they ought. Oh, did I say that? I meant, oh, you, wait, <laughs> what? Did I say that out loud? Actually, I was born in I was born in Pomona, born in, so, oh, in Southern California. Yeah, so there we go. And uh, we have an Emory connection, you teaching there, and I'm a graduate. So, but it's there really great to have you. Uh, and I love this book, uh, Brent. It's just Thanks. I feel like it's so timely for the way in which preachers are navigating a different kind of world. And so really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. So Brent, maybe you could just talk about the title before we jump into anything. Honest to God preaching, talking sin, suffering, and violence. Yeah. So I think I, you know, I had had an idea, the root of this idea for a long time. And in my own mind and in presentations and, you know, if I, if I talked about it in, in class and had a little, you know, line in the PowerPoint or something, I had a different title associated with it uh, that was uh, rightfully, I think, uh, changed <laughs> by the press <laughs> to something that was a little better, like honest to God preaching. Uh, but the, uh, my, my working I, title idea was Israel's honesty and our homiletic, which mm. sort of gets at the, um, the two things that the book is about. How, how is Israel honest and how should that affect our, our homiletics, our preaching? Uh, but I, I like the title a lot that Fortress uh, helped to get us to, and you may have been a, a part of that as well. Um, and so that is the, the big idea is, is the title. It's this uh, honest preaching business. And then uh, the subtitle gets at the three main topics I take up in three main chapters, talking honestly about sin, suffering, and violence. So the title, as good titles do, is uh, pretty representative of the book, I think. Well, and I want to highlight that before we get into some of the meat of your of your book, Brent, that you uh, say on page three of the two major points that you are wanting to make in the book. We only know of Israel's failures because Israel was honest enough to share them. I love that. And the way in which uh, that becomes also a corrective for with mm -hmm. regard to how we preach uh, the Old Testament. And then also how is it that we in our preaching and teaching emulate Israel's honesty? Mm. Because honesty provides a way forward 
perhaps even the only way forward to reconciliation, health, and recovery. And so before we go any further, I want our listeners to hear of those two major points that you are bringing forward in this book and the way in which, uh, the way in which you are speaking into that a kind of honesty that we'll talk about later. That's not about like getting up in the pulpit and like, you know, vulnerability all over, <laughs> yeah, right. all over the pulpit, but it's this honesty that, that Israel's relationship with God uh, embodies and how mm-hmm. is it that we can uh, do that in our, in our preaching and in our leadership too. So I wanted right. to highlight that before we just great. I, yeah, I really, really you. appreciated that. Thank you. You know, we, we kind of get things as we go along in life, you know, good things and bad things, uh, whether they're intentional or unintentional. And, you know, I think as part of my own thinking about my vocation as a Bible professor, and particularly as, as someone who's devoted their life to the Old Testament, you know, part of what I would say my job hazard is, is a, sort of explaining the Old Testament to people who don't feel very positively inclined towards it. Um, for whatever reason. And, um, you know, I think as I've put things together in my brain, I think, you know, a lot of that emerges from what we get in church, uh, again, um, explicitly or implicitly, or even nolly, you know, the null curriculum, what's not present. And I just, uh, you know, slowly kind of putting things together, realized that I had been, you know, kind of a listener in who knows how many sermons where Israel was just sort of uh, beaten up on incessantly as a negative example, even when the primary text that was preached was an Old Testament text. You know, how stupid the people are wandering for the wilderness and for 40 years. Who could be that stupid? You know, and I'm thinking I, I could be that stupid. I mean, I, I think I could. And I'm, 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 I got more than 40 on them now, actually. And I'm still, <laughs> still acting pretty stupid. So I, I thought, uh, you know, maybe this is not, shouldn't be thought of as some sort of like, oh, I didn't mean to reveal this, but I did. And now you can beat up on me for it. But rather, this is sort of an intentional act of confession. And that's a kind of a precious treasure when someone confesses something to us. I mean, it's a, a revelation and a vulnerability. And we could, instead of using it in an antagonistic way or weaponizing it in some way, you know, we could actually emulate it in the pulpit, think hard about how Israel's honesty might actually change our homiletical practices, not just about Israel, but about us and the church and everything else. Stay with that for a minute. Um, so sin. One of, the thing, one of the things that's interesting about, um, I think, our cultural moment now is that the society, as a post-Christian society, has quit thinking about the category of sin. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's often said that where nothing is illegal, nothing is forgiven. Mm-hmm. And so, right, so sin and forgiveness uh, go together. You write in Israel's case, all this honesty about sin is not to blame itself forever, but you know it's on the way to forgiveness. That's on page thirty-two. Mm. So, uh, talk about the connection between sin, confession, and forgiveness in your mind. Yeah, I mean it, it ties in nicely. I mean, maybe too nicely. I suppose someone who's going to be critical of the book about honesty as this key pivot uh, between the three issues, the, the, the problematic issues, as it were, sin, suffering, and, and violence, that honesty is this pivot by which we then can move to something on the other side of those things, you know, reconciliation, uh, 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 you know, healing, and then recovery. Um, and so I, I think that that's, you know, quite true. And in terms of uh, some of the topics I take up, I, I try to at least dabble a little bit in some some theory and some fields outside of Bible and theology so to sort of demonstrate that. And, uh, you know, in, in some cases, um, this is demonstrated empirically, even by psychological research and sociological analysis. But I think for me that, so, so that, that, that research that comes out particularly in, in uh, suffering and healing and recovering violence is also, I think, operative in the sin and forgiveness uh, chapter. And what I think is, it's all part and parcel of a kind of unburdening of ourselves with these things that we literally really can't carry ourselves anymore. And, you know, that goes back to Freud and everybody else with terms of repression and the return of the repressed and all that. 
But I think that uh, what we see in scripture and what, what the Christian tradition has long held and shown to be true is that confession is, you know, the way to healing. I mean, confession is the way to forgiveness. And that doesn't mean forgiveness can't happen without confession. In fact, I think that's one of the fascinating things I came to at the end of the book is realize there's some cases where forgiveness can happen even without confession, but, but confession is good for the soul as, as we say, right. And so sin in my mind is a, as a Christian theologian is to say anything that's wrong, (laughs) only now God's in the room right now, God is somehow involved in the process that, that what has gone wrong is not just a minor faux pas, but it's a faux pas that of maybe massive size that is now got God involved in some way. And, you know, the Christian tradition is pretty rich with uh, opinion that God's sort of always involved in these wrongdoings um, in some, some way, shape or form. And so this, uh, this, this ability to confess is not again, a wallowing in our, in our, you know, evil doing, but is, is, is in process to something else. That's, that's the way it works in confession. Um, you know, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just uh, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, First John, which I, I come back to a number of times in the book. So I don't know if that fully answers where you're going, but that's how I kind of think about it in my own mind. It does. You know, uh, one of the things that I have loved um, the most about being Lutheran is that in our tradition, uh, we normally have begun the worship service uh, with that, with confession forgiveness, and including uh, that's one of the things that the liturgist would, would say, would, mm-hmm. would cite that part. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of traditions don't do that, including ours now. A lot more congregations are stopping that in the sense that it's somehow the idea is it's negative. I, I really like the reframing. No, it's actually honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a tradition that didn't do a confession of sin every Sunday. And uh, so when I was exposed to it in places like seminary, it, it took a little thinking about, you know, but uh, I read the daily office. That's part of my practice. So I'm doing it every morning, not just every Sunday. <laughs> and it's not enough, really, is it? <laughs> <It's just not laughs> <enough. laughs> it needs to be twice a day, three times a day or whatever. But I do think there's something rich about that tradition and it's in the reformed tradition as well it reminds us i mean the, you the good lutherans out there about the simultaneous sinning nature and also forgiven uh, nature the justified nature of the christian that that these both are happening um but but we only get to that justification or that sanctification in my own tradition you know if if it's if it's a, an act of confession if we're allowing the spirit to work with our with us and and uh, so on so Well, I think one of the really key aspects about how you frame this, Brent, is the way in which you name on the front end of the book that in honesty, those three pillars of the of the book about sin, about suffering, about violence, that honesty about sin facilitates reconciliation, honesty about suffering facilitates healing, and honesty about violence facilitates recovery. And that word facilitates, I find really interesting because it's, it really captures that aspect of confession and relationship that this is not a, this is not something that's being solved Mm. or uh, rectified, but you're inviting us into, uh, inviting us into a, a, a way of being a way of faithful being. And I'm, so I'm kind of curious, like where you, uh, how you landed on that on that word facilitates because I mm. think it's a really important aspect of that you, you're you're inviting us into a homiletic that's not for the sake of as I said solving things or the mm-hmm. answer mm-hmm. but a, a but a way of being that really like you said it, it emulates or captures the relationship that Israel has with God. Mm. Yeah, that's a great great question. And as I as you asked it, I thought I wonder how hard I thought about that verb per se. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's a kind of reader response thing now. Ah, now, yeah. yes, it was. Yes. Completely- <laughs> I stewed on it. I, I had the thesaurus out. I was yeah, right, right. Oxford English dictionary. But I, <laughs> but I think in retrospect, it's a, it's a good word. I'm happy to, that I used it because I do think facilitate suggests helpful movement toward mm-hmm. without necessarily promising too much. Um, you know, I, I think, I think, and that's a, 
phrase I got from one of my old professors. <laughs> I think I think this, maybe I don't, but I think I think that um, that honesty does help towards these things, facilitates these things. It may not, it may not guarantee them in every case, but I'm pretty sure that we can't get to those other things if we don't have the honesty. Uh, mm-hmm. So maybe honesty about sin you know, I think facilitates this movement toward reconciliation. And, and even more than that, I want to say it, that I believe it will, but I'm, I'm quite certain, but, but that, that doesn't mean every confession of any sort, you know, uh, you know, does that, but I'm pretty sure you can't get to reconciliation without the confession, uh, at least in, in the main. So I think that uh, in retrospect, using that verb uh, fortuitously or, or whatever, um, is, is re- re- reflects that, that I think this is a process. It's um, processual and um, it's gonna take a while, you know, some of these things. I mean, recovery after all in the, in the last chapter is, a, is an ongoing category. Um, it's not usually one and done and neither is healing, right? There's a difference between mm-hmm. cure and healing. I think Kristen mm-hmm. Swenson has done a nice, nice thing on that in her book on the Psalms and healing. Cure is one thing. Healing, you know, we can get the healing. Cure, probably not. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, forgiveness, well, ongoing. I mean, ongoing, whether you're Lutheran or Methodist or whatever. I mean, that's, that's an ongoing discussion uh, in our own uh, sin-wracked souls and the God who forgives. So I, I think that's how I would speak about that facilitation. It's, it's on the way. It's, it's the helpful process. And it may not guarantee results every time, but I'm pretty sure you can't get to the results without taking this uh, road, at least to some degree. What's your, um, what are some of your favorite examples from the Old Testament about, about Israel's honesty about their own sin? Like, I mean, Genesis 12, uh, okay, uh, you're my chosen, right? Uh, I'm choosing you. You're going to be blessed to be a blessing. So then a famine happens. <laughs> let's say you're my sister, right? Right away, (laughs) Israel and their story immediately shows that Abraham is not like so much a great man of faith or right right after the Exodus, right away, whining, complaining, you know, oh, hey, we used to have food at least, you know, what are your (laughs) best (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, of course, Christians will differ across the tradition about their definitions of sin, you know, what constitutes sin or whatever, but but I, you know, to, to the examples you've already raised, I, I you know, the, in the book, I kind of talk about two that are really hard to say aren't sinful in some way, right? And that is the uh, golden calf debacle at Mount Sinai, uh, where the people are, are breaking the commandments at the very moment, sort of when they're getting enacted, you know, where the covenant is getting enacted. And here's this great betrayal, um, Walter Moberly, I quote, quote Walter Moberly, who calls that a kind of like the equivalent of committing adultery on your wedding night, you know, um, that it's hard not to uh, identify that as sin. In fact, it's, it's identified in the text as a great sin. Um, the other one is, is uh, David's um, act- actions with Bathsheba and Uriah, uh, where it's clear that he's an egregious violation of, of the commandments. So those two are, are really you know, massive ones, but I think uh, those are sort of easy. And I think in, in one sense, and so I think more tricky homiletical ones are the ones you've raised, Ralph, which is like, are, are you know, these things are easier to maybe pick off because, oh, maybe they're not as egregious as these big things. Of course, those are sins, but then we end up, we end up beating up on Israel for these other things, murmuring in the wilderness or whatever. Um, so, you know, those are, but those are some of the big ones. And in my mind, they were really interesting. I have to say, I didn't say this in the book, but I've thought about it a lot that, you know, in, in a lot of the circles I move in, um, there is an unforgivable sin and it is a marital infidelity. I mean, that is sort of in the, in the Christian circles I move in, that's almost unimaginably forgivable, right? I mean, and, uh, you know, someone cheats on someone and the extended family's like, yep, yep, that's over. You know what I mean? <laughs> Forget it. You know, and I, and I understand that. I, I get that. Like, I, I feel it too. Uh, I mean, it's, it makes sense to me that like the trust of a spouse is forever shattered. How could it ever be restored? But it struck me in, in writing the, this chapter about, you know, adultery on the wedding night with Israel and then David's real adultery and worse, 
that here were some rather powerful scriptural examples that would speak back to the Christian circles I work, you know, kind of run in and say, maybe that isn't an unforgivable sin. And instead of kind of like raising our eyebrows at the spouse who decides to stick with his or her unfaithful partner, we should be like, wow, I mean, maybe that is, maybe that's crazy, or maybe that's crazy instantiation of forgiveness um, mm-hmm. that is a foretaste of glory divine. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't speak for, that, for other people to make that decision. Right. But it did, it did strike me that what, what, what I've kind of thought or have been, been encouraged to think is, is sort of unforgivable. Here's these examples, egregious examples. And Israel moves on with God. David remains in power. David remains in Israel's memory. One of its greatest, most faithful kings. It's a stunning, it's a stunning testimony. Well, I think one of the things that you're pointing out, Brent, that I, that I really appreciated too about the book is the way in which this is so, what's at stake here is our relationship with God. Uh, and, and we're, we're framing a kind of theology that we, you point this out at the, in the beginning uh, chapter, we're framing a kind of theology that kind of takes our it takes our liturgy seriously. Uh, mm-hmm. That that uh, that the prayer for purity prior to the Eucharist in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, as God as the one from whom no secrets are hid, mm-hmm. and that the way in which the human condition is so bent on hiding so much from each other, and then we have this sort of false understand false thought that we can actually hide that from God. And so I think that that element too, uh, becomes really an important part of the book where, uh, where you, and you, you talk about Israel's suffering and its honesty about that suffering, that, uh, the movement from Israel's slavery under Pharaoh to being God's most precious, possession that uh that that actually this the the honesty of of preachers and congregants about suffering and about sin Mm. that can actually lead to transformation Mm. and uh and so there's yeah there's something that right there's something at stake theologically in this that i uh i wonder how often we are call to that and, and thinking about that. And I'm wondering what you meant about transformation. Like what, I mean, we talked about this being a process, but what does transformation mean to you? What is that? Mm. What is that? Uh, how would you, I'm, I'm asking you a lot about all your words, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I think also, you know, uh, something that emerged from me in writing the book is in, you know, again, maybe I'm slow, slow to some of these points, but the profoundly in, uh, interjoined or intertwined nature of these categories. I mean, sin can lead mm-hmm. to suffering. Sometimes our own sin leads to our own suffering. Sometimes it's other people's sins against us that lead to suffering. And that suffering and sin, you know, can, can emerge in, in violent ways. Um, mm-hmm. And violence can be, um, you know, an, an, a further index of sin and of course a, a further cause of suffering. So these three things are sort of, uh, I think, operating in some sort of feedback loop of some mm-hmm. sort or another. Um, but I think for me in thinking about this, this transformation question that you, you ask, um, there's something mysterious, I think I, I would have to admit, um, maybe less so if I was, you know, a psychologist or a, a sociologist or something, I might be able to, to identify some of the things, at least in certain situations, more, more directly. But um, there is something mysterious about the transformation I think that happens um, say in the Psalms and uh, Ralph could, could educate us on this, but in, the, in those lament Psalms that, that have this unexpected turn to praise at the end, it's mm-hmm. just what caused that the text isn't clear and people have speculated and said things in the secondary literature, but, uh, but I've, I've thought of it for a long time now in a hymn that I grew up singing as a kid um, which was called he touched me with he being God, of course, God touched me. Oh, he touched me. Uh, And oh, the joy that fills my soul. 
something happened and now I know God touched me and made me whole. Mm. Like something happened is the equivalent of that, that gap in the lament Psalms. How do you go from like, you know, I'm about to die. Oh Lord. You know, why don't you pay attention to me? Oh, I trust in you, Lord. Right. Mm. I rejoice in your steadfast. Something happened. What, you know, the hymn writer doesn't say either, just something happened. Now I know God touched me and made me whole. So, you know, the, the weeping was for the night, but joy came in the morning. And, mm -hmm. and we don't always know exactly why. And I don't know if we can always fully articulate it because it's in some sense, the gospel moment. Mm -hmm. And it's the new thing that happens with the gospel, the unexpected uh, new thing that God um, does and, and makes. So I think that that's the first thing I'd say is I don't know for sure how all this transformation happens, though I'm happy to yeah. say that it is, um, you know, uh, God driven and that God should be praised for it when it happens. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that in the second thing I want to say is that what scripture gives us, what Israel's given us in scripture and the church too in the New Testament are actually sort of mechanisms towards transformation, maybe facilitating, going back to facilitating, that that left to our own devices without some sort of external help of some sort, we might just sit in our sin. We might just sit in our suffering. We might just sit in our violence. But insofar as what we have in scripture are these, these scripts and sites by which people move, by which the people of faith have moved uh, demonstrably from sin to reconciliation, from suffering to healing, from violence to recovery, those are mechanisms of transformation. So how did this happen exactly? I don't know. Something happened. Now I know God touched me and made me whole. But the mechanism, the sight and the script is here in scripture. And that can help us when we don't have words yet or when we don't have uh, the momentum yet, I think, uh, or when we don't even maybe know the problem yet. Um, you know, we might not even be aware of our violent tendencies. Uh, we might not be aware of the profundity of our suffering or our sin. And then along comes one of these texts and sort of holds up a mirror to us. And for a minute, thanks be to God, we, we are freed of our denial and projection. And we say, oh my gosh, that's me in that text right there. What happens next? What happens next? In your, in, uh, you close the book with words, uh, trying to inspire honesty to preachers and, um, this is a favorite from Franz Kafka. A book must be an ice axe to break the sea frozen inside of us. Wow, that's a that's an image, right? And I, 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 it makes me think of Jesus. You know, I, I come not to uh, bring peace, but a sword. You know that. Um, so, what kind of words do you have? Like, to, so here's an Old Testament term, right? To uh, gird up one's loins in order to make a preacher actually risk. Um, preaching an ice axe to break the sea frozen inside of us. <laughs> well, oh, so I'm, I'm going to take two things from people I respect a lot. One is uh, Will Willimon, who's uh, my colleague here at Duke and uh, is a, a great, a great, brilliant mind and also just a hysterical person. Um, I heard, uh, heard him say recently, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, you, you used to have to work hard to offend someone from the pulpit. I mean, nowadays you just open up and read Matthew and everybody's offended. You know what I mean? It's, the present moment means a lot of people are, uh, you know, anxious and worried and easily triggered maybe with short fuses or whatever. You don't in some ways have to, you know, be the ice axe. The, the scripture already is the ice axe. That's what, that's what the Kafka is saying about books that we really need. He says in the larger context, uh, books that would make us happy, we don't need. And books that would make us happy, we can write, if necessary, ourselves. You know? And I think that's just fascinating. We could all write a happy book, a book that makes us happy. What we need is a book that breaks the ice axe, uh, the, the sea frozen inside us. We need, a, we need an ice axe like that. I think scripture is that. I mean, Kafka is not talking about scripture in that letter he wrote to his friend, but he is talking about scripture in my mind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Amos is an ice axe to break the sea so frozen inside us, but so is John the Baptist and so is his cousin and the way they preach. Um, it doesn't always have to be a negative thing, right? It doesn't always have to be, I feel terrible about myself. But, uh, oh, my gosh, I've been indifferent to this, and now I'm not going to be indifferent about it anymore. Mm. I've been apathetic about this, and now I'm not going to be apathetic anymore. Mm. So I think what I would say to preachers is, um, you know, we just have to, this is, I'll borrow the second thing from Brueggemann, we don't have to be 
the ice axe. We just have to present the ice axe. You know, we don't have to be Amos. We just have to push Amos out in front of people and then peek out from the side. (laughs) Hey, check Mm -hmm. this out. Look at what Amos said. Or look at this parable. Can you believe what Jesus said about this parable? This Mm -hmm. is insane. You know, you you don't have to be these people. You just have to be their scribe. You have to be their secretary. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of represent them. And uh, I think that's helpful. I mean, I, I, I'll admit I've never been a week in, week out preacher at a local church. So what do I know? But I think uh, what, I would, what I would do in such a situation myself is that to me, that would give me um, more and more reason to attend very carefully with utmost care to scripture, the scripture I'm preaching. And also it would give me an out when my people would inevitably not like what is said in the scripture. Yeah. Because then I say, look, don't shoot the messenger, right? right. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. just exactly. pushing this text out to you. Now yeah. let's talk about the text. Now yeah. it's easier said than done, right? But Take it up with Matthew. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Say one more, one more question about the uh, book, Brent, before we, we always like to go bigger and hear a little bit more about your general inspiration of preaching and Bible and such. But I think one of the timely aspects about this uh, that I mentioned earlier about this book and why I really want our, our listeners to know is the way in which you also connect this act, this, th- these confessional acts of honesty uh, with, with trauma. And how is it that uh, in, in this collective trauma we are experiencing with the pandemic, how you are inviting preachers into that space of, of, of part of part of the activity of trauma or the necessary the necessity of trauma is uh, is to forget it, that denial doesn't work <laughs> and that uh, that you sit in that place of honesty. And I w- wanted to just see if you had any more words about that, particularly for our preachers when when they're dealing with uh, week in and week out yeah. this this constancy of trauma that we find ourselves in. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm not an expert in trauma theory or, or anything like that, but I've, I've been instructed by Herman's work and, and others. And, um, and, and also this psychologist, James Pennebaker, who's, who's done a lot of work on how um, the disclosure of, of honest emotions, especially um, traumatic emotions, especially in writing has been linked directly to positive immunofunction and um, avoidance of disease and things like that. So he's actually working at the, at the, um, you know, physical level. And it just was so uh, fascinating to me to think about <clears throat> Penna Baker's work on, on that, the importance of disclosure about, you know, difficult things. And they don't have to be majorly traumatic in Penna Baker's work. It could be small um, and it could, or it could be huge. But either way, he's he's drawn connections with with much later onsets of disease and whatnot. Um, But what then later in his his work, I mean, it's there early on, but in the later versions of this book, later editions, it's become entire, almost entirely about writing them down, Hmm. not just talking about, but writing them down. And I'm like, this is the Psalms, right? This is the Bible. This is this is this is Israel's confessions. They're writing it down. This is the way they get to new life. So as you said, you know, denial does not work is Her- Herman's language. I mean, more, even more pithily, maybe no new life comes from denial. Um, no new life happens that way. Uh, and, and, and Israel knows that already in the pages of the Old Testament, you know, millennia before Freud and, and all the rest. But those other more recent instantiations are just more proof of the point. And so I think we have to be aware of the traumas that we experience. And they, again, they are, some of them are massive and some of them are less so. I kind of think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? How big they mm-hmm. are because they're big to us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I sometimes like a line, I don't know where I got it from. Ralph probably will remember. Uh, I got a line from some Psalm scholar along the way that, you know, even in the Psalms, even the king suffers. You know what I mean? Even even the, the, to the top 1%, you know, suffers in, in the song. Everybody suffers. Pablo Neruda said, you know, I know the earth and I am sad. You know, that's the, um, 
you know, you, being alive on this earth means that you're, you're sad in some way. You got some sort of trauma, large or small. So we have to be aware of that. And then also realize that, again, honesty is a way to move, move towards these big categories of, of healing and recovery from that. It doesn't happen if we bottle it up. It doesn't happen if we, if we keep it inside. And even if we don't feel yet ready to release it personally, we can release it through Israel, through the people of God. We're, we're grafted into that now. This is our script. This is our scripture. We can say these words. And that, and that becomes my way of offloading, right? Even when I don't want to offload to everybody candidly about what's going on. Well, I'm going to offload with Psalm 22. And you know, that's, that's going to make a change in me long-term, I believe. I believe that's going to make a change for the better. So that's, that's this sort of business, again, back to transformation and, and how that, that helps, that honesty facilitates movements, even with the most profound traumas, which was a Herm, Herman's work. Well, Brent, thanks for writing a fantastic book. Everybody, honest to God, preaching. Uh, we commend it to you uh, and uh, all your preaching uh, colleagues. Um, by the way, I want to point out, you almost had the the Trinitarian uh, references to the Mons. In one, in one answer, you quoted both Willimon and Bergamon. If you just had Kesemon in there, it would have been like a Trinitarian affirmation. Kesemon, yes. Oh, <laughs> Questions about general uh, preaching. Uh, first of all, um, what's the what's one of the hardest sermons you've ever had to preach, and how did you get through it? Oh man, uh, it's an easy uh, question to answer for me because about last fall, not this past fall, but the fall before, we got a call actually in church right before church that some of our good college friends. Um, their 20 something year old son had just died from an, an overdose. Mm. And they asked me to fly down two days later or something to do the funeral. I can, I can get kind of emotional just thinking about it now. And I'm usually not that emotional, especially in front of, of things. I can usually hold it together, but that was easily the hardest, um, you know, sermon I've ever had to do is to preach Mason Lowry's funeral, um, mm. with my good friends, Bob and Melinda right there in the front row. Um, and their daughter Mackenzie. Um, so that was that was very hard. How I got through it <laughs> is I don't know if I really did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I <laughs> well, there's honesty, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Holly, uh, my wife Holly was there, and our daughter uh, happened to live in the same town, and so she was there too. And I don't think either one of them, especially my daughter, had ever seen me quite uh, weep like that. But you know, what got me through in part was Leviticus. I preached Leviticus at mm -hmm. Mason's funeral because I thought, you know, what makes, what sounds better uh, to someone who's been struggling with addiction for years than to finally be all cleaned up, you know, sanctified uh, mm -hmm. with all that behind you. And, and not only sanctified, but permanently sanctified, eternally sanctified. I mean, Leviticus to me was a, a balm for the soul in thinking about Mason and his struggles and his victories against addiction. And then, um, and his, and his ultimate glory, you know, so. Brent, what, uh, fills you spiritually? What, what are some of the things that, uh, you, you said you do, uh, you do, uh, do, didn't you say earlier about, about referring to the book of common prayer, but yeah. like, yeah, but what, yeah. So maybe say a little bit more about that or what are some of those, uh, habits or rituals that, uh, that you, on which you rely to, uh, to fill your spirit? Yeah. I mean, this is about maybe 10 years ago now. And during Lent, I decided to uh, add a practice, not just take something away. And that practice was to finally get serious about reading the, the daily office. Mm. Uh, and I think at first I just, I was doing the lectionary readings, but then um, I, I have been doing the daily office for, I don't know how long now. And, and I make that a practice and I do my best to not miss it every day. If I do miss, I make up the readings the next day. <laughs> and lately I've decided to shift the practice, the day, the daily office has, a, you know, about whatever, how many Psalms per day and the way it works out is they, and they jump around at least in the book of common prayer. And that means if you follow that practice, it takes you about two months to get through the Psalter. 
but there's another way to do it where you read straight through the Psalter in 30 days. So you can get through it in a month. And so recently I've decided to do that practice. And that means that I do read about three or four Psalms or whatever in the morning and three or four more at night. And so that's actually extended the, the daily office for me from just a morning practice to also an evening practice before I go to sleep. And I, I think that's uh, been meaningful to me. I think, uh, you know, the Psalms, when I'm reading the Psalms in particular, well, I mean, for several things, I mean, the prayers, of course, the confessions um, and the collects and things like that, all that is very meaningful. I have a, a good bit of that memorized now because I've done mm -hmm. it long enough. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to sort of say some of those things to myself, even when I'm not with my, my uh, daily office book. But I think, uh, you know, for me as an Old Testament professor, this is a helpful way to continue to read the New Testament where I might not have uh, daily, otherwise done that daily. Also keeps me in a spiritually reading mode, you know, not just an analytical one for work uh, or for some sort of project. And I think in, in all the cases with the text, but especially the Psalms, I feel like I'm um, trying to form myself, uh, in myself, a grammar of faith, a biblical language that I can, uh, that I can depend on when, um, when the real game comes, because I'm not, you know, right now I feel like I'm just practicing <laughs> and, and uh, thankfully I've, I've, I've had it a fairly easy go of late, you know, um, but the, the, the big games come in and the harder things are coming and I want to be studied up when they do. So the daily office really helps me with that. So uh, the third, uh, the third host on our Working Preacher Books uh, podcast is Bandit the Podcat, who has not yet shown up. Although I've heard him in the background. Bandit <laughs> asks, um, "What is your favorite animal, and why is it a cat?" <laughs> well, it sounds like Bandit already knows the answer. But uh, if uh, if I was allowed to politely disagree with the uh, Bandit, uh, my favorite animal has to probably be uh, my cotton poo dog which we got about two years ago we we went 27 or 28 years of marriage without a pet and then we got a dog and uh finley isaiah is his name finley bonded with me because of course i was having to be on sabbatical when we got him and so he's i'm his person and he's in my face all the time in fact he's usually on my lap so i'm amazed that he's mm. not here but i I suppose as, as annoying as I find Finn, I also find him endearing and very cute. Otherwise, he'd be out with the hawks and owls. And so uh, I would say my little cotton poo, toy poodle and cotton de Trulier, the royal dog of Madagascar, in case you were wondering. So, And I was, I was wondering, wondering that. I was wondering that was that. one of my burning questions. That's um, it. So thank toy you for that. Cotton de Trulier. There is. He's, he nice. does have a kind of royal effect about him, I would say. Very nice. <laughs> well, Bandit has one other question, Brent, and that is, I mean, Bandit probably could eat, what, uh, kit, cat chow every day, mm. Korean a cat chow. What's his favorite? You know, maybe liver or salmon flavored or whatever. But, uh, but Bandit is wondering, what is one food that you could eat every mm. single day? Well, I think it would be, it's, it's limited well, no, it's not limited to solely breakfast. We're like, could, could snack on it later. But Holly, my wife, makes monkey rolls on special occasions, like Christmas morning or New Year's. Morning. Those pull These, apart with the caramel. Oh, the pull apart, yeah, oh. with the brown sugar and all that jazz. I, I could eat that till I die, actually. And so, you know, if I had to go out right now, I would say, let's let's make let's make a big, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, pan of those, and I'll just nice. go out happily eating the monkey rolls. <laughs> Well, Brent, it has been such a great uh, opportunity and conversation with you today. We are so grateful for your time, and I know our listeners are as well. So thanks for being with us. Well, thanks so much. And again, as I say in the book, my special thanks to Rolf for first inviting me to write for this. And so uh, it's a real privilege and pleasure to have done so, to be involved in this wonderful series and to have, have written also for the, the website more generally. And so kudos to all the great work you all are doing for preachers all over the world. I'm, I'm impressed, amazed, and inspired, and lucky and fortunate to be a part of it. Well, thanks, thanks for Brent. listening to the episode of Working Preacher Books Podcast. Stay up to date on the conversation at workingpreacher.org. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook. You can always find the latest at workingpreacher.org slash books.